Raider Nation, what is up? Great to be back here with you on another episode of the Raiders NFL Draft Podcast. Alongside Bucky Brooks, I am Rhett Lewis, and we are back after a quick little hiatus due to the frenzy that was free agency. And man, did, did the free agency frenzy open up with a bang on Monday with the negotiating period through Wednesday, new league year, a few signings trickling in and some trades over the weekend as well. We'll hit on all of that, but Bucky, um, we can now kind of, as the dust settles on this first big wave of free agency, we can take a pause, we can mm -hmm. look at it, and then we can kind of an, analyze it also from a draft perspective. Is it a domino sort of effect once we get into April? So looking forward to doing that here with you for the next 30 minutes, my friend. Yeah, no, it should be fun. Um, look, everyone has to understand in team building process, uh, free agency complements what you want to do in the draft. And you have to look at all of the offseason together. It's not just the draft. It's not just free agency. It's trying to put the pieces of the puzzle together. And sometimes the free agent market is heavy in certain positions and it's weaker in the draft of those positions. So you opt for free agency and other times it's the draft that is heavy in some of the positions. So you have to be able to live in both worlds when you're building a team. And hopefully Tom Telesco and the staff, they're putting that together with AP overseeing it uh, to make yeah. sure that the Raiders are ready to rock as a playoff contender. Yeah. And, and it's kind of interesting because you're not just looking at ads here. You're looking at, you're looking at departures too. And, uh, and so we're going to start with the ads, but don't you worry, we'll get to the Josh Jacobs situation and how the, the Raiders kind of regroup on that front and whether the, the answer as, you know, a backfield share, uh, is sitting there in house or whether there's, you know, the need to bring in, you know, somebody else to, to kind of continue to complement that group. Um, and obviously Amir Abdullah resigning with the team. So you still got some familiarity there. Kaiser white, we can get into all that here in a little bit, but let's start with the big ticket items. And that was the big man in the middle on the defensive front, Christian Wilkins. Massive impact, massive contract. Ian Rappaport, our pal at NFL Network, reporting four years, $110 million deal, including just south of $85 million guaranteed to come over from the Miami Dolphins, the team that drafted him in the first round out of Clemson following a national championship run there, and now coming here to the Las Vegas Raiders. Let's first talk about the player, and then let's get into the fit here, Buck, because you look at the numbers for an interior, bigger defensive lineman, he puts up some good numbers there, and, and obviously the impact can be seen you know, elsewhere as well. Yeah, you absolutely can see the impact. And going all the way back to when he came out of Clemson, he was a guy that was super athletic, uh, just freakish athleticism for his sides. You see the moves skills uh you can see his ability to 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 bend and burst and to really make things happen as he slithered through cracks but he not only has the athleticism to kind of play a game with a lot of finesse he's powerful at the point of attack heavy hands does a great job of winning with power can overwhelm blockers at the point of attack and we've saw in the last couple of years as he's gotten comfortable he's been able to utilize that to become a really a disruptive force on the interior as he makes his way to the raiders he gives the Raiders what all elite defenses must have. They must have a dominant outside pass rusher. That would be Max Crosby. And they need to have a disruptive interior pass rusher, which is Chris Wilkins. And then you have the cleanup man and Malcolm Kuntz. The Raiders yes. now have a front line that can get after the, what we say, let's be honest, the elite quarterbacks in the division, Pat Mahomes, Justin Herbert. We think about all the quarterbacks in the AFC. You have to be able to do it. And if you can do it by rushing for, and drop in seven, now you have the flexibility to create maximum pressure while also, also maintaining maximum coverage in the back end. And look, you know, Patrick Graham knows exactly what he's getting here, right? He was with the Miami Dolphins. Uh, it was a, a part of, it was the defensive coordinator there in 2019 when the Dolphins drafted Christian Wilkins, went on uh, in that, uh, what, 2019 draft, rookie year, 2019 uh, had a couple of sacks, had a, a bunch of tackles, and made an impact early on playing in all 16 games uh, at the time. So you also remember, you talked about the athleticism. You remember the the scene, it kind of went viral, right? I mean, he's always been a big personality guy. So you hear him mm -hmm. on all the wires and stuff. You know, he he's one of those guys that, man, uh, <laughs> talks a lot, has a lot of fun playing the game. So you love that part of it. But the athleticism, you remember in Clemson, at Clemson, when they won the title, he was doing like the full split. In front yes. of the uh, in front yes. of the the podium where they were getting the trophies, I was like, 
holy smokes, this yeah. guy, we're talking about 300 plus pound dude that's out there showcasing the flexibility, you know? You just don't see guys that yeah. have that kind of flexibility. And it's one of those weird things that scouts will fall in love with more than uh, common people. But that flexibility is significant. It also shows up in his play when we talk about the athleticism and what he has been able to do on the interior. Last year, nine sacks. Uh, he has yeah. 20 and a half sacks for his career. But we've seen him steadily uh, progress. And last year was the first time in breakout. the big Fangio system yeah. where he had a breakout. And you know how Fangio likes to put guys – on and on, likes to create those opportunities. When well, that Christian Wilkins has done that, Patrick Graham gets an opportunity to try his hand at unlocking all of that potential. And I just like the fact that you can put him on the same side uh, with Max Crosby. You can create yes. a dilemma for offenses as they have to pick and choose who they're going to slide to, how they're going to double team, how they're going to take care of both guys. Uh, just a, just another weapon uh, in, in, the, in the arsenal for Patrick Graham to be able to, to throw out at defenses and as they continue to i would say make moves particularly with the secondary and those yep. things you feel great about the front that now gives you the flexibility to pick and choose how you want to play in the back end you know i think this you know we can start to kind of look at things you know you look at um you look at where tom telesco come, comes from right with the mm -hmm. chargers and understanding the importance of the big men right the big men up front remember uh, what drafted jerry tillery uh, you know, drafted, mm -hmm. uh, you know, had had guys like Corey Legit up there in the in the front of the, the L.A. Chargers at the time, drafted the big guys up front of the offensive line, Rashawn Slater, you know, Zion Johnson, like those guys understanding that that's where this program, this franchise wants to be built. I mean, you can kind of see the importance of a move like this. And then, you know, as you're looking around right at the Raiders depth chart, you know, you're it, it's obviously everything's unofficial and still a work in progress uh, in a big way. But now you're looking at John Jenkins, uh, Adam Butler from a couple years ago, um, uh, two years ago for Matt Butler. But and then Tyree Wilson comes into that mix. And now you've got some real pieces to kind of throw around and feels like this this be kind of a and, and look when we get to the draft right on April 25th, you're sitting there at the 13th pick. There's still an opportunity, you know, if that's the best player on your board to go out there and make another another kind of hit at, on that uh, defensive front. But I feel like it it takes away the pressure of, of feeling like that's a need when you get to the first round. It does, and it allows you to take the best player available. You know, before when you yeah. go with multiple needs, you, you, you feel this internal pressure that, man, I have to take a player at this spot because I just don't know if we're going to be able to fill it out. Uh, when you address it in free agency and the way in which they addressed it, uh, you're just able to kind of go and 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 yeah. play, and I think for Tom Telesco, for Antonio Pierce, you want to have the flexibility to be able to look at the board and say, "This is the best player on the board. We want to take him, regardless of whether it's a need or not." You just want to add great players to the roster, elite players to the roster, because if you're going to upgrade the talent, the only way you can do it is by taking blue chippers. This and that's gives a blue them take blue chippers. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's, it feels like so. You now you've got a couple of blue players up on the front, makes you feel pretty good about where you're going and and how you can then continue to fill and upgrade at the second and third levels uh, of the defense. Okay, uh, that's obviously the biggest signing of free agency for the Raiders at this point, but not the only one, right? Because later on in the negotiating window, we find out Gardner Minshew, uh, after playing the majority of the season for the Indianapolis Colts in relief of Anthony Richardson, who went down first quarter of the season with the shoulder injury out for the year. Gardner comes in, damn near leads this team to the playoffs, right? I mean, they were, they were a fourth down conversion shy of making the postseason in a game against the, uh, the Houston Texans. Um, obviously the Texans come out on top Colts end up going home, but Gardner played fantastic fantastic work Gardner Minshew played you know had some fantastic work in that spot starting duty and now he comes over uh to the Las Vegas Raiders on a two-year deal high level backup money if you're looking at it from that perspective mm -hmm. two years 25 million 15 mil fully guaranteed according to Ian Rappaport and Tom Pelissero so that's kind of like that to me feels you know like spot starter slash bridge money Right. And that's not mm -hmm. just QB two money. Cause that's, that's, that's up there. And, and I feel like he's earned, he's earned that. Yeah. He's earned that. And he's earned the opportunity to compete for the job. I know that Aiden O'Connell will start off as QB one, yeah. but Garner Minshew signed for the kind of money he signed for. Uh, they certainly would give him a look. And if he outperforms Aiden O'Connell during the preseason, he might be the week one starter. Uh, this is a great opportunity for the Raiders though, to have 
two quarterbacks that can go after. You have Aiden O'Connell, who uh, people in the building uh, love him. They love what he was able yeah. to do as a rookie. They love the steadiness of his game and how he handled it. You've heard AP reference O'Connell a few different times over the offseason, just talking about how he has the goods to be QB1. For Garner Minshew, Garner Minshew is someone who, look, he, he's played as a starter. He's played well as a backup. He has the upside. You bring in him to compete or whatever, like, you're hoping that their competition raises the level of performance throughout the quarterback room, and eventually you have to make a decision on which one deserves to get the ball on opening night. Yeah, I, th I think it's kind of interesting because I, I still feel like as we look at this from a um, as we look at this from a draft perspective too, you know, sitting there at 13, now there's a lot of conversation about not just quarterbacks go one, two, three, perhaps quarterbacks go one, two, three, four four within the top six. So feels like there's going to be four in the top six, whether that's a team trading up and into like the Minnesota Vikings who acquired that extra first round pick now gives them some ammo to move up from 11. So now you're kind of starting to think about this thing here. And does this at all change the way you view the quarterback priority for the Raiders, let's say at 13, if you know that fifth guy is there. Does that now that you have Gardner on the roster to go along with Aiden O'Connell, does that change anything in your mind about the need to go out and get one of those high level potential franchise guys? Well I think it allows you to have a more honest assessment of those high level guys that could be remaining on the board at that pick. It now becomes uh, a situation where Tom Telesco and, and Antonio Pierce will uh cross reference the best quarterback that's available with the best players that are available in other spots. And if it's close, it should go to the quarterback. So we potentially could be talking about uh, Michael Penix at 13, yeah. maybe a Bo Nix at 13. Yeah. How do they compare with some of the guys that could be available at those respective positions of need? What offers the best long-term value? Well, we know uh, in the league quarterback is everything. And if you got a quarterback, man, it gives you a chance to be able to bunch, do a bunch of different things. This debate could go down between, all right, let's take Michael Penix, for instance. Yeah. How does he compare to uh, Byron Murphy? How does he compare to yes. some of the other guys at the position? Let's, say, let's say the second cornerback off the board. Let's say Terry and Arnold, right? Let's say, you know, yes. Nate Wiggins, guys like that. Yeah, how, yeah. How, that's where the conversation and the debate could lead to how do the Raiders – feel about the fourth or fifth quarterback compared to maybe some of the top choices at some other right. positions. Right. It does QB five make more sense than mm -hmm. cornerback two offensive yeah. tackle three uh, or four, depending on what happens. Cause it feels like, you know, Joe Alt, uh, Olu mm -hmm. Fashanu, uh, Talisi Fuaga, uh, you know, maybe Troy Faltano, uh, like you're all in that, in that, that kind of area, right, where anything could kind of mm -hmm. start going off the board once you get past, you know, eight, nine. So I think um, I think that's interesting. But what they've done, again, I think is, you know, shrewd move, you know, and, and a great move for the team to go out and bring a dude. By the way, everyone in that locker room is going to love Gardner Menchu. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, he's a dude who just endears himself to his teammates. He's a fierce competitor. He loves to play, loves to win. Um, mm -hmm. And he's been a QB two before, despite the fact that he finished this season, you know, starting, you know, multiple games, 10 plus games for the Colts, you know, this year, you know, ends the season as a starter, but has been in that, that role mm -hmm. before with a young quarterback. Right. And, and, you know, handled himself very well, very professional. Yeah. So I think all that stuff works in the Raiders favor when you kind of weigh in all the possibilities that might happen chain reaction wise from a Gardner Minshew sign. All right, so those are really the biggest moves offense, on offense, and defense for the Raiders. I mean, you look at a couple of re-signings. Amir Abdullah, who we mentioned at the top. Andre James coming back. Gives you some continuity there. Three-year, 24. Nice deal for Andre James to go in there and yeah. try to continue to anchor the middle of the offensive line at center. Um, but again, I think you're still looking, you know, in that the right side of that offensive line. Is there, you know, it's going to be hard to pass up a, you know, a, a big-time right tackle like a J.C. Latham or a Fuaga or whomever. Uh, if those guys are there at 13 to continue to try to upgrade that unit. So those are still possibilities, certainly. But the the big notable on offense that you're losing is Josh Jacobs, yeah. right? Uh, you know, rushing champ from 2022, had a good year last year, uh, and he goes off to the Green Bay Packers on a four-year, $48 million deal. Well, that's big money, you know, for a back. And 
Um, before we get ne necessarily right into the individual play with Josh Jacobs, when you look at the running backs in general, Buck, because you know we talked about your top guys a couple of episodes ago, but the top dudes of free agency went off big and went off in a hurry. Saquon Barkley, mm -hmm. DeAndre Swift, uh, Jacobs. I mean, like all those guys were going. Derrick Henry all found spots very early in free agency. Do you feel like that tells us anything about the strength of the running back group in this draft class at all? Yeah, I think it's, it's it's very telling because teams always let you know how they're thinking based on the moves that yeah. they're willing to make league wide for the league to say that we're going after these veteran running backs and we're going to Older. pay them top dollar. We're going to pay yep. them 10 to $12 million. We we're okay with it. It suggests that they don't view this running back class in the 2024 draft top pilot. They don't see them as having franchise caliber guys, guys that are going to kind of move the needle. So they were willing to entrust uh, the responsibilities and duties to older guys. And we know at court at running back, you never get an opportunity to make big money uh, based on how this league has kind of gone to yeah. the Shanahan view of yes. recycling quarterbacks and using committees. I think that speaks to maybe the the lack of talent or the perceived lack of talent uh, that scouts uh, view in this class at the position. Yeah, great point there. So now let's look at Josh Jacobs. I, I think, you know, they the Packers kind of completely remade their running back room, right? They mm -hmm. signed Jacobs and then kind of immediately cut Aaron Jones, who moves on within the division mm -hmm. to the Minnesota Vikings, which I think was a good signing there. Um, but Josh Jacobs brings a more physical component, right, to the to the backfield there. Now, that's essentially what the Raiders are losing, but Zamir White has been that that kind of a player that can bring mm -hmm. a little bit of that pop in the pads, right? And then you re-signed Amir Abdullah, so you've got the two. And then look, there's a we could we could talk about you know guys like uh, you know Sincere McCormick and you know Britton mm -hmm. Brown and and others that that are you know kind of those depth pieces in that running back group. But does this still feel like a place where you think the Raiders might try to look now? Maybe let's say once we get into day three, day two, early day three in the draft, where maybe that sweet spot for the running back value is. Yeah, I think the sweet spot will be day three. Uh, yeah. I think if anything, when it comes to the running back room, they're going to look to add a rotational player. doesn't yeah. seem like they're going to go uh, big on any of these running backs. And when you think about the running back position, when you compare them to the guys that we were talking about that were on the street, the Saquon Barkley, the DeAndre Swifts of the world, um, look, even Joe Mixon hitting the streets. I can't make a great argument to say that any of these guys are better than those guys are right, right. now. Uh, right. The conversation will be, what do the Raiders want in that that extra running back? Do they want the every down back, the guy that can give it to you running the football, kind of like Blake Corm, a uh, little like Trey Benson, or do they want someone that can kind of change it up and make it happen, like the Urban type or yep. whatever? A lot of it has to be down. Will come down to job description. What is the job description for the RB that you're looking for? How can we kind of make sure that he fits what we want and get him at the right? price the right value uh when it comes to the draft yeah and you know i we we've talked about this uh before a bunch you know with our with our buddy daniel jeremiah too uh you know like i i was i became infatuated with a certain running back out of louisville uh his name was isaac garendo uh, oh yeah with that four three three and a 40 with that track speed um mm -hmm. we saw him at the east west shrine bowl you know showed that he can catch the ball out of the backfield and gives you kick return value Right. So when you throw all that in and, you know, you've got a guy that's got good hands, you've got a guy that's got explosive game changing speed and special teams ability in the return mm -hmm. game. Now you start to increase some real, you know, some value, probably day three, somewhere, somewhere there. And you know, it might be a, a piece to kind of look at uh, a little bit as uh, the Raiders try to figure out exactly what they want that running back room uh, to look like on the de defensive side of the ball. Um, you know, look again. I don't know that there was there was a ton that we were talking about in terms of departures. Amik Robertson uh, goes over to the Detroit Lions, a uh, guy who's been a big time contributor, especially mm -hmm. late in his his initial rookie contract with the with the Raiders here last year. Uh, you know, was a good player, and mm -hmm. so now you know again you're you, you do you have the high level guy? Do you have the the A one stopper that you need? That you that you you know that you feel like you you'd like to have in this division. Um, and then now do you need to supplement the depth a little bit too? So how, how do you kind of view the the secondary as we push forward to the draft? Uh, I think there are a couple guys that could be in play uh, yeah. come draft 
night. Uh, they have yeah. to look at it because as it's presently constructed, you got Jack Jones, Trevor yeah. Merrick, Marcus uh, Epps, Brandon Fajan, and Nate Hobbs. Those are the five. When you think about yeah. another cornerback, it's probably on the horizon and another playmaking safety. When do you choose to expend those picks? Well, Antonio Pierce has talked about making sure that the team is solid at the line of scrimmage, where we saw Christian Wilkins go. So from the yeah. defensive front, they appear to be pretty solid. They do need to address uh, the of the offensive line. Then it becomes that debate that we, we do. Who are some of the offensive tackles that are available versus who are the defensive backs that are available? Yes. And which position has more depth? I would say that the depth of the cornerback class makes it where you can get a Max Milton that can come from Rutgers and and, and play and do some things in the slot or, or be able to go outside, yeah. those things. Like, there are guys that will be available for the Raiders in the second and third round that can come in and start, which could free them up to maybe attack the offensive line early and come back and address the secondary late. Yeah, I think that's kind of a, that's an intriguing, you know, uh, scenario right there because the depth is good. It feels like with, you know, with both of those positions, now there may be more high level talent in the offensive tackle class and the offensive line class than there is in the, in the cornerback class. But it feels like there's a good swath of depth that goes, let's say from you, where you can find real value from, I don't know, 10 to 35 or 15 to 40 in that group where you can find a, you know, a cornerback who you could count on you know, as a rookie. And then obviously still hoping Jacorian Bennett can bring more and more as he continues, you know, his NFL career going into year two after his rookie campaign uh, out of Maryland a year ago. So um, just some thoughts there on some of the pieces that have kind of come in gone uh, for the Raiders. Uh, we are going to be back with you again later this week with a, another episode. Bucky, we got pro days coming up. Quick primer here because um, this is a big one coming up this week. It is arguably the biggest one. And like, I don't know that it's going to be in the Raiders purview and vision, but we got to talk about it because it's going to determine how the rest of the dominoes fall. And that is the odds on favor to be the number one overall pick in this year's draft from USC, Caleb Williams, who has not really done anything in terms of the draft process mm -hmm. aside from meet with teams as of yet. And so now we know that the Bears have traded Justin Fields, right? We know that that's. You know, we're moving moving on there. So it's it's paving mm -hmm. the way for that quarterback who we expect to be Caleb, who we will get a, a chance to see on Wednesday at his pro day at USC. Um, now, I, I'm kind of curious, like if you were Caleb Williams and you've kind of seen the way he's handled the whole process, knowing that the Bears have that open spot now with Justin Fields gone, like, are you going to do anything on Wednesday? <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I think he's just going to put polish on the performance. I wouldn't expect yeah. it to last long. Right. Uh, I wouldn't expect him to do a lot of the things. Show you got a pulse. Are, yeah. yeah I, I wouldn't expect <laughs> to see him do a lot of the athletic testing and those right. things. I think this is him showcasing his arm talent, letting him dazzle it a little bit, but more yeah. so a hour long infomercial on why Kelly Williams is going to uh, revive the Chicago Bears and make them a viable contender in the NFC. Lastly, here on that front, just because of the the Justin Fields angle, um, Buck, I, knowing that Luke Getze spent two years with Justin Fields in Chicago and knowing the price tag that came with him and that he was going to go, you know, for a six round pick that could turn into a four based on playing time, knowing the Raiders situation at quarterback, does it tell you, it tell you anything about, you know, the player and a potential reunion with Getze that that, that wasn't the way that they wanted to go? Well, I mean, like it, it could. I mean, naturally, yeah. people on the outside are going to look and see like, hey, the former offensive coordinator right. didn't try and bring him over. Is there something that goes on? But sometimes guys can fit in certain places, but not may not fit in yeah. other places. And dependent, yeah. dependent on the vision that Antonio Pierce had for the Raiders and how they wanted to play. Justin Fields obviously was not the guy for the gig. They yeah. wanted, they went out and got Garner Minshew. You would appear that you would think that those trade discussions that Justin Fields was having at the end of the week, those were going on throughout the yeah. week. They opted for Garner Minshew because they feel that Garner Minshew is a better fit. Uh, we'll see if that is part of a series of chess moves at the right. position or right. if it just came out to, hey, we feel good about Aiden O'Connell and Garner Minshew. We're going to roll the ball out and see which one of those guys can get it done. 
A good point. And uh, look, there's a lot of variables that go into any quarterback move, of course, and fit is uh, almost always the biggest one, obviously, once you get past the the natural talent and uh, production part of it. So, uh, all right, like I said, another episode coming your way later this week as we uh, dig in on all the pro days that we have seen thus far. We've got the Bo Nix pro day is in the books. We'll have the Caleb Williams pro day in the books. All those Georgia dudes have have come and gone as well. So look forward to digging in uh, to all of that with you on another episode of the Raiders NFL Draft Podcast later this week. But for Bucky Brooks, I am Rhett Lewis. Thanks so much for being with us today. We will catch you later on this week.